The United Nations peacekeeping force failed time and time again in many places around the world. Why is that? They don't necessarily always succeed at bringing peace and stability in the regions where they are stationed. Despite all kinds of resources that they have, human resources, finances, international backing, and yet, the outcome of their interventions is not as what we would expect. Let us look at the case of Congo. These ideas that I'm sharing come from the book called The Frontiers of Peace by Dr. Severin Otoseret, who has been an international humanitarian worker in many places around the world and a college professor in the US. She has an extensive experience from the field research she conducted. <laughs> In the Democratic Republic of Congo, the United Nations Peacekeeping Force, MONUC or MONUSCO, which stands for the United Nations Organization Stabilization Mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In the year 2020, it had about 18,300 people. That's the personnel, most of them military personnel. This force has been in the country since 1999, particularly in the eastern region, which has seen the bulk of the conflicts and violence. 30 nations are involved in this peacekeeping effort. And by 2020, close to 9 billion US dollars have been used in this effort. This war in Congo has been dubbed as the deadliest conflict since World War II. 6 million people dead, 4.5 million people who are internally displaced as refugees within their own country. More than 1 million Congolese refugees around the world. So you have the international community heavily involved in solving these problems in Congo. You have a lot of money being poured into it and you have um, all kinds of resources that the UN is capable of harnessing, all being put into uh, this effort. Nonetheless, Eastern Congo remains a volatile place. Dr. Otesser explains that there is an attitude of superiority that international aid workers have when they go to these third world countries uh, which are experiencing conflict. Instead of working with their local partners, they mostly regard them as inferior. So there's a general attitude that these international peacekeeping experts have towards the locals. The stereotypes of backwardness, you know, they are corrupt, they are untrustworthy, incompetent. So these people, they come in the conflict zones with sort of like a white savior syndrome and they show little respect to the locals instead of partnering with them. So she explains that there is a forced distance between the helped and the helpers. There is very little interaction between these international peacekeeping experts with the locals on the ground. Most of the time, these uh, aid workers remain walled into uh, secure compounds. They are only interact with their peers. They, are, they mostly interact with their uh, you know, foreign soldiers who are protecting them there. So there is basically very little interaction going between the foreigners who are coming to help and the communities that they help. And, and uh, Dr. Otesser explains that these barriers have to be broken. These international peacekeeping experts, most of the time, they are not aware of the intricate political, social, and security conditions on the ground from the standpoint of the locals. So the humanitarian strategies that they design is not really geared for success because it doesn't take really into consideration the contextual factors on the ground. She explains that they often deal with consequences rather than the roots of conflict. And if you want to understand the roots of conflict, you have to go deeper than the surface. It's not enough to just interact with politicians uh, or, or, or the elite in the, in the capital city, in Kinshasa in this case, but you really have to know what is going on at the grassroots level with the local leaders the chiefs, the teachers, the, the local policemen. You kind of have to have a working understanding of the dynamics on the ground. Dr. Otesser here gives an example of how uh, diplomats from the EU, from the US, were 
congratulating each other for the peace agreement that had just been signed in Kinshasa, causing up with the elite in Kinshasa. While in Goma that very week, more than 10,000 civilians had just fled. Signing a peace deal on a paper doesn't necessarily translate into actually peace happening on the ground. Again, because there is this divide between the elites and the, the international community leaders and experts and the actors on the ground. Dr. Otesser mentions what she calls Peace Inc., which is basically the conventional way of doing peacekeeping or of ending wars. Again, this way works on paper. It works in um, ballrooms and conferences in big cities where experts and diplomats and you name it, they come together and they strategize and they have these big and expensive initiatives which cost a lot of money and employ a lot of people. But in the end, they have nothing to show for it for the most part in terms of tangible peace actually happening for the people. She calls it top-down, outside-led peace efforts. Trickle-down peace. When it comes to Congo, you've had presidents and uh, rebel leaders meeting in cities like Lusaka in 1999. The whole logistical operation cost up to three US million dollars, yet there was no peace. In 2002, they met in Sun City, South Africa. This was an endeavor that cost up to 4 million US dollars. Nothing happened. In 2008, they met in Goma to sign peacekeeping agreement. Here we're talking about leaders, rebel leaders, presidents, uh, diplomats, the logistics of it, the security considerations, all of that endeavor cost about $2 million. Now she's explaining that all this money was spent trying to bring about peace in a conventional way but all this money was lost. This money could have been used to actually empower the locals on the ground so that peace may grow more or less organically. So in her book, she's really critiquing this conventional approach. She's not necessarily saying that all of these efforts are meaningless or fruitless, but she says that unless they are complemented by the efforts on the grassroots level, by the active participation of the people on the ground who are impacted by that peace or by that war, these efforts will always be insufficient. She says elections don't fix wars. So you have basically the international peacekeeping experts focusing on elections, focusing on different things. But if there are no infrastructure on the ground to facilitate that, those elections, or even now um, if there are endemic problems in the society that are not addressed, these elections will not work. I mean, how many elections have we had in Africa here and there? Fake elections, rigged elections, or even sometimes legitimate elections. But in the end, it all comes back to chaos because there are structural societal problems that have not been addressed. And elections alone are not going to fix it. Some of the alternative approaches that she proposes are providing micro loans for the people, training uh, local leaders and teachers into peacekeeping strategies and having them get involved. Um, she laments that more money is used in peacekeeping military efforts than in actually preventive efforts. And if you spend more effort in actually trying to prevent by training people, by providing opportunities, then you won't have to spend as much in trying to avoid wars. She says that the alternative pathways to peace must include, here I quote, understanding and making most of local belief systems, promoting an active culture of nonviolence, relying on grassroots associations and strengthening community bonds. This is the least expensive and most effective approach. So the outside effort need to have this indispensable element of collaborating and cooperating with the local agents as equal partners. As I conclude, I would have to say that African leaders have, for the most part, failed us because why should we wait for foreigners to come in our land and teach us how to bring about peace? Don't we have elders and wise people who actually understand that the best way to solve conflicts is through dialogue, seeking negotiated settlements rather than pushing for a zero-sum win-lose situation? 
refusing to talk with other constituents of your community, of your country, those who don't see things eye to eye with you, is a recipe for disaster, maybe not in the present, but in the future, in the future generations. A lot of conflicts that we have today in Africa, such as in Ethiopia and in Mozambique right now, have roots in legitimate grievances caused by corruption here and there, which are not solved early on. And then they blow up into full-scale conflict because leaders are not responsible enough or far-sighted enough to try and solve these problems comprehensively with a sense of togetherness ahead of time. It's a shame that international aid workers have to come into our countries and teach us to love one another and teach us to honor one another and teach us the value of peace. I call for a younger generation of African leaders to learn from the mistakes of the previous generation and chart a new path so we can be able to enjoy peace in our generations and in the generations to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah.